Hello, everybody. Welcome again to the Doomer Optimism Podcast. I have my trusty sidekick here, Ashley Colby, and a special guest, uh, Michelle Bowens. Uh, just for a little bit of context for myself, I've been following Michelle's work for a few years. Uh, it's shaped a lot of my thinking, especially around these notions of cosmolocalism, uh, peer-to-peer, the commons, and I've even taught some of his uh, text in my classes, in my college classes. So um, I'm a big fan and I'm excited to finally get you on, Michael, uh, Michelle, uh, Michelle, sorry. Uh, it's, it's Michelle, but Michael is fine because- Okay, uh, either way. I lived a year in the US and I was always confused with female at the, you know, back in the days. Right, so, okay. Uh, yeah. you know, I know Michael is more easy in the US to avoid confusion, but yeah, you're right. My name is Michelle. Yeah. Okay. Which, okay. Uh, in in French, we add a we add a e when it's female. You know. Oh, and, right. And uh, without e, it's the male version. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll try and remember. I'll try and remember how, how you pronounce it. Uh, so why don't we start? Uh, give a little bit of your background, whatever you think is relevant, um, and we'll go from there. All right. So, um. Okay, so I'll just do the digital part of my life. So in I in the nineties, I, I was very pretty early with the internet. Uh, at least in Belgium, I, you know, I was really one of the first ones, and especially one of the first ones who saw that, like this would change the world and be applied to business and government. And and um, and then I created two startups in the nineties. Uh, one that uh, was called Ecom. It was sold to Alcatel. Which would, it used to be like a big telco at that time, and then I did another one called Kyberco, which was sold to another holding company. But that one didn't do so well because uh, you know it was two thousand, uh, so you know like the internet bubble bursting and losing like ninety percent of your clientele in you know just a few weeks. Um, and I ended up working for. Uh, like a digital strategy post in the biggest telco of Belgium. But I was getting like unhappy about what I was doing. And, you know, I saw the world was, I didn't think the world was going, you know, moving forward in any positive way that I could see. Like, you know, everything you looked at was going a bit downhill. Um, it was also the time of the Zapatistas, of the, the Seattle movement. And so, like, in the mid-90s, I started thinking, like, am I part of the problem or am I part of the solution? And I thought, like, in these big companies, I'm not part of the solution. I, I you know, I'm. this is getting toxic and, and you know, uh, you know, short-termism and, you know, fiddling with, with the accounting, you know, all kinds of stuff that you see happening. And so... But I didn't know what to do, so I took a two-year sabbatical. And the aim of my sabbatical, which I financed by myself, was to really to think through how how transitions occur, right? Because I I grew up as a you know radical left winger when I was in my twenties, um, and obviously you know the the strategy of like yeah you know the big revolution and then we will change everything didn't exactly turn out the way uh, we expected it. Um, Around what year so, was this sabbatical? So this was 2000 um, and two, 2003. Okay. Um, and I I had just, you know, been to Thailand uh, on a holiday and, and as happens many times here, <laughs> you know, people get stuck. Um, because Thailand has a surplus of women, um, you know this is just objective fact. Like the, there's a lot of trans people here, so you know it's like twenty percent of the boys are not available, and so there's a three century long tradition of you know intermarriage here. So I, I fell into the trap, <laughs> and I've been happy ever since. Um, but that was like a good convergence between my desire to do. Uh, the you know sabbatical and knowing that if I would come here, like my money would go four times more, right? So at at that time it was like the the level of pricing was like twenty five percent of Europe, 
maybe now it's like 35. Uh, but you, so that means if you have one thousand dollars in you know in Belgium, it feels like four thousand here, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why Chiang Mai and Thailand in general, but Chiang Mai especially, has been a very attractive place because it's a real city. Um, you know, it's not city like you know you can find in Thailand some places like Pattaya or you know in Phuket. This is like a normal city, very cosmopolitan. You know where the grocery shops are more richly stocked than in Spain or in France because you have Koreans here and and Japanese and like the whole world is here. Um, and this place went from three hundred thousand to one million, um, and and now it's the Chinese way. We have one hundred thousand Chinese that moved here since two thousand thirteen. Uh, so this is a special place that you know, and if you. I don't know if it's interesting, but if you put a, a circle of one uh, one thousand kilos or miles, I can't I, don't, I forgot. You have like two thirds of the world population around Chiang Mai, you know. So this is this is not like a, I feel this is a special place, and so I moved here, and I studied transition, uh, but mostly at that time I was looking at you know Roman Empire feudalism, like the Western stuff, because you know two years of reading is really you think it's a long time, but like it's gone like before you know it. But I, I came out with a very clear uh, idea that, you know, seed forms are the key. Seed forms? Right? Seed. seed forms. Seed, seed form. forms are the key. So basically the, the classic idea of the left, you know, the revolutionary left was, you know, you, you create a, a revolution and you change everything. But you know, the, the, so you have the French and the Russian Revolution that stuck in 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 our minds. But they, they, those are very exceptional, right? There's like at least ten different ways it went in Germany and and uh, in Sweden, and, and so there's many ways in which the societies can change. But it's also a long process, and so you could you could argue that if there weren't capitalists. You know, we wouldn't have capitalism, right? So it's it's a so markets are pretty old, to three thousand years old, but the type of capitalism that emerged specifically in Europe is because we had free cities, weak empire, and so you know the market forces could develop themselves unimpeded and create a world to their image, right? And so the way that that happens is through seed form. So you have a system, let's say feudalism or the Roman Empire. And when it ended in its descending phase, you know, it just doesn't work anymore, right? So either you have people with anticipatory, anticipatory consciousness, the pioneers, the idealists, the utopians that, that you know, think through and say, we need to do something different. And then you also you have all the people who are just pushed out of the system. You know, the, so, you know, the, the slaves uh, flee or are freed by the Germanic tribes that come in. Or you know the serfs flee their land to go to the work in the cities, or they chase the way to the cities. So you have like a crisis, an exodus, and then both the managerial and the productive classes have to kind of find something new. Uh, and the way that happens is through seed forms, through pioneers that invent new ways of doing things that solve issues that the old logic cannot solve. Right. Okay. So for example, purgatory. I know it's a strange example, but you know, if you were a Christian under feudal Christianity, you couldn't lend money; you would go straight to hell, right? So once they say for purgatory, you can lend money, and then you can buy an indulgence, and you free yourself from your sin, right? That's a perfect uh, ideological hack mm, that that's would the allow liberatory thinking right there, thinking ahead, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know somebody else invents the printing press, right? And that allows ideas to move so much faster that the you know the 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 institution of the church can no longer control uh, ideas. And then you have double entry book accounting, right? So these are seed forms that within capitalism, within feudalism, create the seeds of of a next system. And then you know they form a subsystem. Let's say that the printing press is combined with 
a company system so that actually company is doing the printing, thing, right? And they use double entry book accounting. And so suddenly these patterns start coalescing um, and the social forces around them start strengthening. And then you might have, you know, a, a qualitative step at some point where, you know, the, the, the emergent alternative actually becomes a dominant new form, right? And so, actually, if I if I can say something maybe provocative about uh, crypto here, and I know some people think this is far fetched, but but just follow my reasoning. So, okay. five thousand years ago, right, we shift from kinship and tribal organization with gifting and commoning as the dominant ways of value exchange to civilization with classes and castes and independent military and states and markets. Right, it's a very big shift that occurred about five thousand years ago, and this was, was is because of writing. So you have a new class of people who are who who invent the alphabet, which is much more convenient than the ideographic and cuneiform uh, uh, alphabet. So they invent the alphabet, and so the people who can read become an elite, right? Uh, and they will be at the service of the kings and, and the churches and the temples. And, and so there is like this new managerial uh, elite that is created and that manages society. So now we invent code, right? And we invent a group of people who know how to code. And not everybody knows how to code. They have computers as their means of production which is very easy to acquire, but they don't control the networks that make them work together, right? So what do they do? And I think this is a, a, a parallel. So they try to create a world according to their image so that they can do what they want to do. And so naturally, because they're, they're kind of craft workers, uh, you know, they're not proletariat in the sense of working 10,000 people in a big factory. No, they're all like independent, you know, freelancers mostly uh, and so they're creating this new world of infrastructure that is anti-big government anti-big finance and I'm not saying it's working all the time and it's very problematic and we can discuss the details but I think this is very important because the, the big change for me is from a geographically based civilization right where are you familiar probably with Jordan Hall and his, his idea of civium, right? So he's basically saying that cities are super linear in their effects. So sublinear means you have, you know, you double your body, but your brain doesn't double. It's only 85%. So that's a sublinear relation. You lose efficiency with scaling. But according to a, a criteria of innovation and all of that stuff, that's actually super linear in a city. Because of you know all that collective intelligence and the level and the depth of the connections creates a force for change that is just not available in the countryside, you know where. Um, and so here's the argument that by creating the digital, right, we've we've created a new superlinearity which is not geographic, right. And so that means for me that the market and the state forms which were adapted to this geographical form of civilization are actually now also in crisis. And so I'm an advocate for what I call mutual signaling uh, as the new form of, of societal coordination. So if you, if you look at open source, urban, urban commons, crypto communities, what they're doing is they're creating open ecosystems where everybody can see what everybody else is doing, right? And so that means that's next to market pricing and next to, let's say, hierarchical command, you have millions of people now working through horizontal forms of coordination, which never scaled before, but are now scaling so that even if you're like a capitalist company, you'll be more competitive if you, you know, move towards open source uh, practices, right? And so all of this is happening at the same time, but I, I think this is coalescing into, you know, and that's why I call it the fourth generation civilization. Um, so the, 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 
So ju just to be brief about this, but so Spengler is like the first macro historian who, who you know, really looks at the whole world at the whole time and works around the notion of civilization. And he says a civilization is a self-contained organism that goes through birth, youth, maturity, and death. And it's about 1,000 years. And there's nothing you can do about it. And then you die as a civilization, right? And so European civilization, according to Spengler, uh, only started in the year 1000. So now we, we're at the end of that story. Toynbee, who came after Spengler uh, and wrote a 12 volume, The Study of History, the, the Spengler is called Decline of the West. And he says, that's not entirely true because there is actually also accumulation. Accumulation of complexity of technology of knowledge and so what you get is generations of civilization and there's different ways to read it but you could say okay so you have mythical civilization you know they follow their gods uh, and their gods speak to them and their local gods and then tell them what to do like in Assyria and Babylon right then you have mythical rational civilizations like Greece or the Christian West where you know they're kind of both at the same level and people believe but they can also philosophize at the same time right and then we have the, the western industrial civilization has become rationalistic and rejects uh, belief and mythology right so you could say these are like three generations of civilization um, and so the fourth generation would be uh, one that is you know, where the dominant factor is actually, uh, um, so this is my thesis, it's not the market and the state, but the commons. And so maybe I, I can give you a little uh, argumentation around that. So so I, I see civilization as cyclical. You know, everything pulses, everything is polarities, you know, matter, life, human culture. So you get an ascending phase, you know, when everything works well and is being synergized and, you know, as, as a new model and it's working and it's productively oriented and it's it allows the, the, the country to expand, right? And it always reaches a peak and then it starts descending. In the ascending phase, the extractive institutions that depend on growth and conquest work well to provide everything you know, to create legitimacy and loyalty in the core, uh, you know, of its of its uh, geographical location. When it's descending, this is less and less the case. So more and more people fall outside of the boat, and so my I call this the pulsation of the commons. So the the commons weaken in the A phase, but they are gaining strength in the B phase, right? And so, but this was always local and regional. And so when, when one society would collapse, you could, you know, the civilization would just move, basically. So you can see, like in China or in the Mayas, you know, a succession of capitals. Even Rome, you know, Rome and then what was it, Ravenna, and then it was, you know, Byzantium. So you, you so it moves around because it has exhausted its core. You know, they you know overuse uh, wood and and you know the the agriculture is, is declining, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And so the commons, this is a generative institution. It's designed to preserve over the long term. So it's not so good at extraction, but it's very good at providing the basic needs of a local population, right? So for example, if you think, you know, why is Switzerland so green or Austria or Japan? It's because the villagers manage their mountain slopes for the long term, so that the children and the children, their children can, you know, can get the nuts and the fruit and the, you know, and, and all the stuff that is so, and, and they managed to keep the control of that over the centuries, even today. Right? So if you if you actually take a satellite, you 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 is very clear that the commons are regenerative because those are the green areas in the world. And you know, the ones that are brown are the ones that are being extracted. So it's actually just the opposite of what you know, liberal market thinking things, which is, you know, make it private and uh, and then the, the private property will, you know, preserve, 
preserve it, right? But that's not how it works. They they exhaust it and then they go somewhere else. Because you know we work with money now, right? So if it doesn't make if you don't make money here, it doesn't matter. You go somewhere else and you make money there. And the commons is linked to real communities in place. But here, here is the big change. So we're now at a stage where we have an international state system and a transnational financial system. The transnational system has become stronger than the interstate system. So change within the nation state has become impossible. Whether you want to do it on the left or on the right doesn't matter, you know. You, within three days, they close the banks. You can't get your money from the ATM. Um, so you, you, so we can't do the politics we're used to. That's why people go crazy because whether you vote left or right doesn't make any difference. You know they're they're so constrained. So I think what that means is that we have to create transnational counterpower. You know, productive civic systems, right? And that's what I call cosmolocalism. So making sure you have access to all the provisioning systems that you need, so food, energy, transport, housing. But at the same time, you, you need to have the super linearity of digital proximity. So everything that's heavy is local and everything that's light is global and shared. So it's about combining relocalized distributed manufacturing and production but with commons institutions that have all the protocols of cooperation at scale. And so you, you go from economies of scale to economies of scope, doing more with the same thing. And any innovation in the network becomes instantly available everywhere. And so I think this is happening, but you know, of course it's happening in a messy way and there's corruption and there's speculation and you know, capitalism tries to get its hand on it and, and change its nature. So all this is going on, but I think underneath it, there is a transitioning that is actually occurring already, right? And it's ne yeah. not nearly yeah. enough, but it is it's there. Many people know it, many people are trying it. So there is energy there to do this. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I, some, some counterpoints. Okay, so first, yeah. first of all, I completely agree on your assessment of the civilizational structure. This is my, this is like my <laughs> wheelhouse. I love this, uh, thinking about like the rise and fall of civilizations, where we are in that process and um, what we can possibly do to, what is the word you used? It was so good. Um, anticipatory consciousness. I love that. Right. Um, so I love thinking about that. And that's basically like right in the wheelhouse of where this podcast is, is, is thinking, you know, in an anticipatory way about like where we are, um, you know, in historical cycles and what we could possibly do to be prepared for what's coming. I think the nitty gritty details of what that means is what we dig into all the time because we're trying to figure right. out, you know, are our assumptions correct? Uh, is the way forward correct uh, that we're, you know, perceiving. Um, so there's two things that I'm interested in digging into a little bit. Um, one is, so the movement from that you were talking about 5,000 years ago from like this kinship gifting civilization to, you know, written civilization with markets and states and all of this stuff, to me is a move toward more alienation in, in so far as those who have um, the power to write, then have more control over other people. Um, then the state and market sort of take control away from the more local um, and kinship and community and relational and like human scaled uh, understandings right. of ledgers of you know debts and you know gift economies as opposed to you know like a more rational written uh, level. And so my cons my first concern is that taking it from that to then the digital is necessarily a step in the direction of more alienation um less like for less human scaled embodied you know in nature in ecosystems understandings of ledgers and it's more alienated and more difficult to parse uh unless you're 
well versed in it, which then can make a class of people who are well versed and can kind of take advantage of people who don't know what's going on in the crypto world, which is happening. You know, there is a lot of like utopian thinking of, oh, the crypto will just make make sure it's secure and then it'll work great. And then, oh, OK, I guess it just ha so happens that governments can still control this um, somehow, uh, even though we've said that they shouldn't be able to, but they can. So so there's some concerns I have, like just about the the utopian thinking, although I really like the um, I really like the anticipatory part of what you're talking about and and, you know, concerns about that. And then the other part that I'm um, interested in parsing over the course of this conversation is you said the heavy parts and the light parts, the heavy parts should be local right. and the light parts should be global. I completely agree with that. Um, but let's talk about which is which, because I've also come across a lot of crypto people or people who are sort of into like smart cities or commodity, you know, let's get everything digitized who are not, who do not have a very moral or thoughtful approach to which is heavy or which is light. And they kind of just want to digitize everything, which then just turns the whole world into a panopticon. And I'm like, you, we cannot, we cannot just be like, you know, <laughs> make everything digital and therefore all our problems go away. Like, there is actually a pig-headedness that's required to not digitize some things. Right. Okay. So I can, we can dig into those yeah. those topics. But wait, okay. hold on. Before so, before you go back again, yeah. Michelle, I want I want to hear Jason's take too before we get back into your response because maybe it would be fun right now, Jason, to talk about your back and forth with Balaji. I don't know if you've ever talked about that on the podcast. I don't think we've talked about that uh, on the podcast. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that real quick. Uh, so Balaji, of course, has this idea of the network state. And I haven't read the book, but I did read a passage. And from there, it seemed to me that he was trying to create this new kind of global elite class of people, digital nomads, you could say, who kind of go around to their various territories that are within the network state, uh, don't have very much skin in the game in any one particular territory, um, aren't very well integrated into the local cultures. And, and so I critiqued that uh, in, a, in a thread. And I actually said the alternative is something more cosmo-local uh, where you each node you could say is well integrated in the culture and you do have people who are there long-term and skin in the game. And he responded and we had a back and forth and he eventually suggested that there was a compromise of what he, uh, referring back to the uh, Hanseatic League uh, and, and then thinking like a digital Hanseatic League would, would be yeah, yeah, yeah. a cosmo-local application of his network state idea but that was my concern with the, right. the kind of Balaji line of thinking and that line of thinking is that i am concerned with this idea that, uh, these ideas of digital nomad that you have a bunch of nomads but you don't have any localists you don't have actually any people who have been there for generations I, I, you know what i mean yeah, yeah I, I, I actually understand yeah. the evolution of that culture and society and so so yeah and so that there was a little bit of back and forth there um yeah i i actually i want to say that i fully sympathize with both of your critiques um and so um let, let me first say a little bit about alienation um so you know i actually experience this myself so just at a personal level i'm an only child from one orphan mother and, and a semi-orphan father. Uh, so, you know, I come from the very atomized Western society. And here I live with my Thai wife and her mother has 11 brothers and sisters who have three and four children who have one or two children each, right? And my neighbors is my wife's family, like in three sides. And I cannot, you know, describe how happy I am here. Like I'm literally in a sea of love, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's, I don't know why it still exists here to, to a certain degree. You know, it's not perfect, but it's, it's, it's better preserved 
than in many, many, many other parts of the world. And one of the reasons is that Thailand was never colonized. And so, you know, capitalism is actually very recent here. It's from the Americans in the 1960s with the Vietnam War. You know, I mean, they had they had trade and, and markets, but they didn't have production. You know, they didn't have consumer society until very, very recently. So, you know, it's it's going to evolve negatively here as well, but slower and, you know, with, with a huge delay. And right now, you know, there's still a lot of this kinship thing going on, right? And so, yeah, yeah, that's what happened, right? We lived uh, in kinship. And maybe we died earlier and all of that, but like you were living with your uncles and your aunts and you know clans and this and that, and so that's the life that we lost. Um, but it's inevitable, and so I, I'm a big advocate of multi-level selection theory. I, I don't know if you a bit familiar with that. You know, it's basically like you know, so animals you know, have this kind of, uh, you know, healthy animals survive, weak animals die, and then you get your genes, you know, to the next generations. But in humans, it's not exactly the way it works. It's a weak member of a strong group has more chance to survive than the strong member of a weak group because we are organized and we fight amongst groups. And so unfortunately... You know, that alienation was inevitable. As, as, as long as you have one group that decides to arm itself, you know, if you, do, if you don't respond to that, you're the slave, right? So that's, that's a drama of civilization that occurred, you know, 5,000 years ago. And I was reading a book about the history of Greece. And, you know, I, there's a word for that, I forgot the word now, but literally, you know, there was a process whereby one city, one one region decided to build a city to protect itself, right? And then all the other communities in Greece had to do the same. And so that's how you got the city-state system in Greece because you needed protection. There was raiding, and so so that's one thing, right? It's 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 you have to respond to it. And then the the next thing about technology, I think, is a bit more. I I think we are technological beings. So that that what makes humans human is actually you know that we have language, that we have tools, that we build structures, that we can adapt. But I also agree that this is a factor of alienation. And okay, maybe you think this is utopian, but so I, I, this is an example. Um, so, you know, the average age of a Thai farm is now like 58, right? And one of the reasons is when the children go to public school, they don't want to farm. It's done. You're finished. They just don't want that kind of life, right? And so I imagine an education system where you farm. The kids farm two hours a day, and then they craft two hours a day, right? So what you're doing is you're building these layers of connection and, and embodiedness, you know, and that's what we don't do in Western civilization, right? That's what the dualism, the Cartesian dualism has completely destroyed, but it wasn't, you know, always the case. And, and you know, I, I'm a, actually a, a fan of the Middle Ages in a way because, but, but follow my reasoning. So this was a very local civilization, right? People lived in parishes with their, fa they had family, they had, they had two days a week. They didn't have to work. Sunday, the day of the Lord. Blue Monday, the day of the family. They had, I don't know how many saints. So like uh, uh, historians, you know, they think that they had between 100 and 150 days they didn't work. I mean, you know, they were active in preparing festivals and all the kind of stuff, right? And, uh, and then you had like the church which created a unity over a vast territory. So you had both localism, uh, but you still had interconnection and, and joint culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had in the Middle Ages, free cities that were run by the guilds, right? And so I, I just want to tell you that story because that's what the commons is about. So in the fifth century, Europe is completely destroyed. Actually in the eighth century, but it starts in the fifth century. And 
you know, in, by the 8th century, you have the Saracens, the Muslims come, you know, and they're up like 80 kilometers from Paris. The Vikings come from the north. The Avars comes from the from the east. And it's a, it's a total mess, right? Um, and so how, how do the European people react? So the first thing is the Benedictines. So in the 5th century, there's no food in Italy. And so the rules of St. Benedict, it's a craft agrarian congregation, right? You live together, you, you work the land, you make stuff, and you learn all at the same time. So it's a very integrated life. It's no sex, that's something else, but, uh, you know, uh, but it was a very integrated and balanced life, right? And all the surplus goes into the infrastructure. You know, there's nobody with the yacht that's two billion and you no, know, and it's, no, it everything goes. So in 50 years, the Benedictines has restored Italian agriculture, and the Sister Senses did the same in the 11th century. 70 percent of the land was reclaimed by the Sister Senses, and you know, each time they had like I forgot the number, like 48 or 64 people, they had to split like a bee swarm, and then the the set the you know, the a group had to find new land and they would start over, right? And so so they create a surplus from the land and so that creates the cities and in the cities you have the guilds and these guilds are also a commons organization. You know, they collectively own the means of production. You know, they, they have these three levels um, and they restore city life in Europe. So for me, this is an interesting example you know, we always think in terms of the Dark Ages, but the Dark Ages that was like five to tenth century. That was the Dark Age because everything was disorganized, constant raiding. Um, but you know, once you know, European civilization is actually restored and recreated in around 975, right? And the commons are very effect effective in recreating a cosmo local civilization. That's my point of view. So, you know, I'm I'm kind of a neo-medievalist in the sense that I think that what is happening now is kind of similar. We are both relocalizing, but we're creating infrastructures of cultural exchange as a layer. And of course, and that might be utopian. So my hope is, of course, that this combination of things is strong and competitive enough to eventually overcome the crisis of the the system that we now have, right? But if you look at transitions in the past, you know, transitions do happen. So crises happen. So you have, you know, ascending phase, descending phase. Then you have crisis and transition, right? And then after a period of chaos, the things uh, surge again. So you have a new cycle, ascending, descending, crisis. And then you so you have so this is what I've been studying for the last year and a half is because you know I was very confused about all these cycles, and so I have a pretty good idea now of all these cycles actually intersect with each other, and so my theory is that I, I hope that is the right word in English that we have a concatenation of cycles, so we have a fifty-year convertive cycle, the hundred-year seculum, the, which is also the war cycle and the hegemony cycle. We have a four, five hundred year cycle, and a one thousand year cycle, and a five thousand year cycle, and they're all ending right now. And so each cycle requires different things to re to be resolved, and that makes that's why we can talk about a meta crisis, right? Because it's not just like an addition of things. So we need an integrative mindset. To understand that complexity of oh okay so the cognitive cycle is mostly political economy so this we can solve by you know some economic adaptation but the second one you know the fourth turning I'm sure you're familiar with that you know Strauss and Hall the fourth turning so we are in the chaos phase of the hundred year cycle that's a public and civic reorientation so we need new civic and public institutions to recreate an integrative narrative that we are that we have lost, right? Um, and so every cycle has its own logic. And so we need to know not just where we are, that's very important, 
And you know, I can tell you, I don't like cheese and wine when I'm in Chiang Mai. I don't know why, but the, just the place, right? And the and the climate tells me this is not good here. As soon as I've, you know, I'm in Europe. <gasps> cheese, cheese. I want to eat cheese. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's some it's it's place, right? Place is really important, and capitalism destroys place, right? Now we have, I forgot what it's called, but. You know, like a universal equivalent for for ecological destruction, right? So you can say, oh, I'm going to destroy this forest here, but don't worry, I'm buying these credits so that we can create a forest somewhere else. But that's like terrible. That's terrible. Because, you know, the people who live in locally, they're fucked. Right? Yeah. So, uh, sorry, I shouldn't use uh, that it's language. Fine. But, <laughs> Uh, many many things uh, have been have been said on this podcast. Yeah. Um, so so this is the so the, but so when is also important, right? You have where we are and when we are, because you know there's things you can do in an ascending cycle that you can do in a descending cycle. You know, I I, I give the example like Disney makes crap, and you can argue why they're making crap, but even if they wanted to make a good movie, they can't. It's just because of the, you know, the general decline of our culture. You know, people can't write anymore. I don't know why that is, but that's like typical for an end cycle, right? The, in the decline phase, like the culture is just copying itself, right? So now they make music and they make these hooks and then they put the hooks together, they test the hooks. But like, there's no composition anymore. You know, we, we don't compose music. And how they make series is like by committee, and you know, they sit together and say, "Oh, should we do this? Should we do that?" And so that like there's no more harmony, right? The narrative is gone. And so this is very typical, like culturally, of an end stage. Um, so I think so. Freedom starts where you once you know what determines you. If you don't know what determines you you're not really free. And so integrative thinking is the capacity, I think, to see different lines of development and change and to be able to creatively combine them and be aware of them, right? I don't know. That's maybe overambitious, but that's the way I think about, about this. So so there's a couple, there's a couple topics I want to dig into a little bit. Um, so one is on the commons. Uh, so how most students think about the commons is Eleanor Ostrom managing natural resources. Uh, we know that commons have been common institutions throughout, you know, a lot of history that we know about, um, a set of rules that communities practice to manage common resources. Uh, and th th so, so that's common resources themselves are, are kind of a particular kind of, of good, you can say. They're, they tend to be non exclusive. You have a set of rules in a community, at least right. you know, they're exclusive to the outside of the community, but not within the community. Right. Um, but they're right. also usually rivalrous goods. Uh, this is, you know, kind of in the economic sense yeah. of like, if you use too much, they'll be depleted. You, ca you can have uh, tragedy right. commons if you don't have good institutions. Um, and when we talk about um, kind of the flip side of that kind of good, you have uh, non-rivalrous, let's say, you can't kind of run out, uh, but they can be excluded. This, these are normally called artificially scarce goods in, in like an economics te textbook. Right. Um, and it seems like what cosmolocalism is trying to do or trying to create this kind of, you know, have this shared uh shared community of, of what is light, as you say, um, these fall in the category of artificially scarce goods, meaning that it's like software or knowledge. And if my, in Microsoft's hands, they'll exclude people from using it unless you buy their product, even though the marginal cost is zero. Uh, but with the open source movement, the idea is no, these actually don't need to be artificially scarce, right? They're, right. they're actually not rivalrous goods, not like Again, you know, there's only a certain amount of grassland you can put your cows, but you know, this software once it's created, it can be duplicated infinite number of times. Uh, but in our capitalist system, they are treated as exclusive, and they don't need to be. And so it seems like you're, 
in this form of the commons that you often talk about, you're it's actually- It's an inversion. It's an inversion, right? Commons to be beyond its, its original application, which is really interesting. Uh, you're saying that- yeah, So I, actually, I think capital, yeah. Sorry. You can actually combine the traditional notion of the commons of natural resource management, and we can say more local communities managing their resources, and we can combine that with making this new kind of knowledge uh, technology not right, um, not exclusive, and then you get this kind of cosmolocal system. And then last thing, uh, this differentiation between superlinear and sublinear. And so the idea I, I read recently, Jordan Jordan Hall's article about this, and it was very similar to your ideas. I thought, but hey, I, I mean that that language actually got from him. So okay. Particular, okay. Uh, the idea is that why did we aggregate to the cities? Because you have this agglomeration effects. You have these superlinear effects returns to, to innovation and, and all of these things, but with the internet and with the possibility of distributed knowledge sharing, the that that force bringing people to cities is weakening. And so that, you know, and so people might like, I can work from home, we can talk over the internet. Uh, work from home is, is obviously one, one example of this, but suddenly we can share knowledge. We can have this super linear relationships of, of innovation putting our minds together without being uh, in the, the metropole, so to speak, right? We can be, you know, ideally, theoretically, we can be in our local communities doing our local stuff, our, our, our natural resource and cultural commons management. And we can have be having these, these, these super linear effects. And, and, and one thing you argue is that if we localize without being connected, it'll be a sublinear effect because we'll be cutting ourselves off from a lot of knowledge and technology and we'll stagnate and right. probably won't work well. And so you need to have this localization while maintaining this kind of super linear effect that, could, that used to only be possible in the cities, but now is can right. be more distributed. Yeah, because I, I think power is important, right? You, you're, you're not just yeah. like, oh, it's nice to do this. It's nice. No, no, you, you're, you're living in a complex world where you know there's all kinds of conflicts and so you have to be strong as your community or whatever however you define it but then you have to think like okay this is the political economy that we're living in mm -hmm. and so we better know how to do that and, and get you know what i call it jurisdictional alliances right the capacity to create coalition between groups so that in, and and okay, so I I just want to say so I I think what capitalism does right it's it turns things on its head so it pretends that the material world is abundant and it's not and then it pretends that abundant things should be scarce and they're not and so while the market is justified as a market as a scarcity allocation system but you know pricing works really well for that it has become a scarcity engineering system, right? Creating terminator seeds and, and so, and the localization part is important because we spend now three times as much moving things around and actually making them, right? So, so in terms of sustainability and balance of the world, you know, and getting into a steady state economy, we, we need to do this. This is like, for me, vital. It's you know it's uh, it's just inevitable that that we we can't just continue doing what we're doing now. So uh, uh, um, you know I call it a subsidiary subsidiarity of material production, right? Not everything needs to be localized, but you know we need to think this rethink. All right. Um, so then at the level of the knowledge. Um, I, I take a bit of a controversial point of view here because I think between copy left and copy right, they could be in copy fair. And so here's the problem. So the more communistic the license, the more capitalistic the practice. So open source licensing has led to a software economy which is completely dominated by large capitalist companies. Because if everybody can use it, so can they. And then they have a lot more capital to do stuff with it than you have, right? So what, what copy fair would be, uh, you know, this is called like strong reciprocity. Um, uh, in French, it sounds really good. Uh, licence à réciprocité renforcée. 
So license it with reinforced reciprocity. Is you say, okay, you the knowledge can be shared, but commercialization is dependent on reciprocity. And I think this could create a cooperative alliances, you know, and and domains. And so what I call magisteria of the commons. This is something I want to uh, maybe introduce also to your audience. Is so transnational finance inter international state system, right? What we don't have are commons institutions that can operate at the same level. So I see a fractal organization where, you know, if, if you can succeed in having a jurisdictional alliance at the local level, so you have the city, the commercial sector, the research sector, and the nonprofits allied together to support the commonification process, mutualized provisioning system at the local level to preserve them, right? In, in a world of increasing scarcity and resource scarcity. So if you have that, that's called the quintuple helix model in Italy. So that already exists. You know, they're, they're doing, the like Italian cities are doing this, you know, because they're, you know, I was in Padua and Pavia and maybe I confuse it too now, but, uh, you know, they were losing like one shop every day one shop closes every day, you know, in, in, in the inner city, right? So so they, they're, they're using the commons as a territorial strategy to, to protect their, their local economy. So quintuple alliance, four plus one. And I imagine at the transnational level, we would have the same. So let's say you want to do car sharing, real car sharing, not Uber. Um, so mutualizing... Uh, transportation and you know I, I did this project in Ghent in Belgium where they had two projects and one had thousands of members and every shared car replaced nine to 13 cars and it was like 80 percent cheaper for the members and they had a full guarantee to have a car whenever they they needed and you know and, and they calculate that and said okay this is not uber right this is like a neighborhood based system and then they have different levels to compensate for weaknesses in one neighborhood or another. Uh, so these systems, you know, wh why would you rewrite the software for that, you know, in every city, right? That doesn't make any sense. But that's actually what happens. I, so I went to Tuscany and they had like 20 pieces of software to order organic food only in the solidarity economy. Like what a waste of energy and resources. So that's why you need you know, knowledge commons, right? You need protocol co-ops. So cooperatives where all the co protocols of cooperation are designed, protected, learned, certified, shared. Um, and so I imagine then at the transnational level, you would have a similar quintuple structure of, you know, ethical investment and su support NGOs that would, you know, support the knowledge comes, right? And so, and these institutions would be the protector of the commons, right? And that's because we have a commons gap, right? We have a commons gap, not just at the local level, but also at the, glo at the more global level. Okay, so that's that's my, my thinking. And I want to address um, actually what you said about uh, like the selfishness of the crypto crowd. And I completely agree. So this is like the exodus uh, principle, right? It's so there are a number of people who think they can escape physicality, right? And so this is what the sociologists like, what is it, David Goodhart and Eric Kaufman and Matthew Goodwin, you know, the somewheres and the nowhere, right? And so this is this is this is the the class war. Of our of our time, right? We had the Christians and the pagans, we had the Reformation and Catholicism, and now it's the culture war, and it's the people who cannot move, bore the brunt of neoliberal globalization, lost the local businesses, lost their work, but can't move because they they're not educated and they don't as much and they don't have the digital skills, so they've been getting angry and frustrated. 
Um, and then you have the nowheres and well, okay, you know, if Portugal is doing badly, let's go to Greece. If Greece is doing badly, we can go to Bali, yeah. right? And this creates this mentality where, you know, oh, with our Bitcoins and blockchain and the idea, who cares, we can escape. And no, there's no escape. At some point, they'll be coming for you with a pitchfork, right? <laughs> and so I think the nowheres should see themselves as everywhere. So from rootlessness to rootfulness. So see yourself as at the service of the local communities. So we'll have re relocalization, but we need people like the, the, the binding elements of the cosmo local, right? The agents of the cosmic within the local. This is what we should be. And so, you know, in the labor movement, we had, you know, organic intellectuals, right? This is Gramsci and, and, and so normally intellectuals work for power because you, you get your money from the Messinas and, and right? So then because the labor movement self-organized and paid dues, they created the layer of intellectuals that were at the service of the labor movement and has been completely destroyed. That's why we don't no longer have working class culture. And okay, here, this is where, you know, some people hate me for this, but I'll say it anyway. You know, the left has become the voice of the elite cognitive class, mm -hmm. which is allied with financial capital. And yep. they're leaving the other people behind and they think they're deplorables and fascists and this and that. And so what I see now is we have a fight between two factions of the oligarchy, the, you know, the pure globalists and the people... I think represented by Trump and Brexit and these kinds of forces that are more rooted in local industry. And, and they're connecting with the working class against. Uh, and so very important is the notion of ideological cartel, right? So you have the 1%, they own, but they don't manage. Then you have the 20%, the PMC, professional managerial class. And they are run by ideological cartels. And the 1%, they look at, like, who is best for us? So after World War II, you need a social compromise. We'll promote the Keynesians. You know, that was the A phase. That got stuck in 73, 1980. Uh, end of the peak phase. Yeah, Keynesian is not working. We get inflation. No, no. So let's promote the Mount Pelerin Society. Right? And now, now we have an identitarian cartel because divide and rule and and so we can continue to do our thing that's the way i think of it yep and it's very very dangerous of course because if you're working class you have nowhere to go but to the to the right wing populists which have their own problems um and so i don't know how this is going to be worked out um, but Toynbee has a very good example. So, you know, he talks about the Christians, the Jews, actually, in uh, around the year zero, right? So you have the Zealots. The Zealots hate Rome. And they have three wars against Rome. They lose all three of them. And eventually that creates a diasporic uh, necessity, right? And then you have King Herod. The Herodians are the compromisers. You know, let's work with empire. And maybe we can learn from them and then eventually become stronger and get our revenge later on. But he says the winner was neither of them, right? It was St. Paul, who had like a new mix, a new hybrid of both. And he succeeded with his church of blanketing the Roman Empire. So the solution you know, he's not in, in those two sides, right? Neither the Catholics nor the Reformation actually won the Civil War because Hobbes and Smith won the Civil War, right? And they created a new system which marginalized the church. But now we're in this interregnum, right? We're in this, uh, Gramsci calls it the, the time of monsters, right? The old is not dead yet and the new is not yet there. And so we get all that stuff. But there's no solution in there. That's not where the solution is. And I think the solution is in local communities, looking at your provisioning systems locally, but but connecting and organizing constantly. And this, this so now I'm going to make a pro-crypto uh, argument because 
I shared your 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 analysis, right? So what I was seeing was all the DEOs, and they were always dealing with money, like but they're out there, you know. How should we decide who spends what, who gets what? But I didn't see anything connected to production. And then I see all these urban commons alliances which exist, and they don't use crypto. But then I went to Montenegro, Suzalu, Montenegro. And I was sitting on a table where they were discussing the environment. And there was a deep adaptationist, a doomer, right? <laughs> oh, we fucked. Nothing we can do about it. Uh, then we had like a impact investment, you know, greenwashing type, yeah. right? And then there was a climate denialist. And you know what? They had a friendly discussion. And I was shocked because I haven't seen that in years. You know, people that talk about this topic without wanting to kill each other mm -hmm. virtually. And the reason is, is because they have a commons, right? They're all working on an infrastructure that they all can use together, even when they disagree about all these topics. And then I met a Chinese group, and they're my employers, uh, so I have you know, conflict of interest. Um, so I'm working for a network nation called the Global Chinese Commons, and they're Chinese crypto nomads. And, you know, it's almost illegal to do many things now in China. So they create a network of places where they can do their work and go back to their families, you know, when they're not doing crypto and stuff like that. And and they were using um, what's it called quadratic voting to manage their physical assets. And I thought, wow, that is different. This is the first time I see this. And so, okay, I think this is this is the way to go. And they they want to be at the service of local communities. They invest in public goods production, and they want to promote Chinese involvement in the global crypto community. So these for me are like you know proto everywhere, right? And and I'm very proud to work with these people. I, I think they're you know they're great and. So I'm not saying everybody in crypto is like that, but there, you know, there are, there are people. And I think the beauty of crypto is that these people can work together with other people. And, uh, you know, like you have socialists and libertarians and somehow they, they accept each other. And where else can you do this? Um, I would just, uh, one thing I've been thinking about as you've been talking is um, this concept of what you brought up before, which was, um, you know, the creation of city states is sort of driven by um, one group, maybe it's just overpopulation relative to resources, but one group taking up some violent um, culture and then everybody else, sorry, has to uh, adopt that because it's, um, right. you know, either defend yourself or, you know, uh, I've heard this called the parable of the violent tribe, you know, basically right. once you, once one becomes violent to defend yourself, you have to be violent or to, to run away that yeah. they take over your area and then it's, you know, gets colonized. I just don't understand how in a, a digital crypto environment, that same uh, theory can't can't also apply. I mean, you can have these peaceful, cooperative, digital groups. Um, how do you? There's a chicken, chicken coming up. Um, there. How do you? You're from um, Maloka, I can see it. <laughs> yeah, I know. You can bring the chicken yeah. to the conversation. Yeah, um, can she'll join run us. away from me. Chickens are just like one tiny bit faster than every human. You can never catch them. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, how do you not, how does it not get colonized? This is my my biggest concern with something like, you know, digital uh, understandings, da data, being able to control data. There's just this huge incentive to, you know, go the immoral route, you know, to take yes, advantage but... of it, to, to not make it open source, or once it is open source, yeah. to then, oh, so I, I have a profit motivation to take this and and you know close it off or to control people with it so 
you know, I, I don't think you can do this forever, right? But if so, so there, again, this is very cyclic. But if you look at like the, the city states in Europe or Greece, they, they last around 300 years. Um, and then they, you know, they, they got corrupted by, you know, the Medici, the Medici and, but they did succeed for a certain time to protect a, a relatively strong egalitarian culture. And so, and the, the way they did is, is through anti-oligarchic protocols, right? So, uh, you know, this is from reading. So for example, in Italy, you know, the, the city would buy the grain, sell it at a fixed price, and only after 5 p.m. could the merchants, you know, operate on a market basis, right? So why, why this is normal, right? If you have if you have hungry people in the city, you have a riot, right? You don't want to riot, okay. Uh, and then they had hooded magistrates, always from other cities, so they they were not emotionally connected to local people, and they had the right to execute merchants on the spot if they were caught, you know, selling, speculating on food, right? Uh, another example, the mayor of Dubrovnik, as soon as he was elected, he was put in a villa with guards. He couldn't get, he was not allowed to get out of the villa for two years. And everybody who came to visit him had to sign a register. So this was against, uh, you know, lobbying, right? Uh, in Venice, they had like a 15 round voting system just to avoid manipulation of the votes. Um and, you know, in my Chinese community, they have explicit, you know, quadratic voting mechanisms. They're very strong on, you know, on not allowing money to overrun the community. Do you want to describe so that's, quadratic voting real quick? I, no, I can't. I, I haven't done enough reading to know exactly how it works. Hmm. I, I did read one or two articles like a year and a half ago, but like, no, I, I, I can't really... What I understand is it promotes people who are regular contributors. So not the ones with a lot of tokens, but the ones who with little few tokens who intervene a lot. They they get like a, a higher weight in the voting procedure. Um well one well one thing I would say no, I sorry, I, I don't really know. One thing I would say is um there uh, one thing I've been thinking about too as you're talking. It's possible also that there is like this, the thing I, I think about a lot is there is this sort of bifurcation going on where there's like, you know, the alienated exploitative class and maybe they all kind of associate with one another. And then there's this, you know, more cooperatively minded um, approach and those people associate with each other and they can just kind of like, you know, see which right. one does well. And the other thing I think about a lot is, um, something that's happening in advanced uh economies is that people are not reproducing like you were saying right right in thailand right. are going into public school and not wanting to farm a lot of those people don't even want to have kids a lot of times once they've gotten into the city yeah. and they get into advanced no, so no. i i mean i think there is like an inevitable evolutionary pressure happening also with too much alienation, too much, um, yeah. you know, advanced but, economic but growth. But you know, the end of Rome was exactly the same. So August, August, are you saying English? Augustus. Uh, yeah. Augustus, Augustus, right? Yep. He was already aware of the problem. So he had a law that even forced people to marry and have children. It didn't hmm. work. And so Italy got depopulated, uh, Gaul, Spain, and then North Africa got depopulated. This is one of the main reasons Germanic invasions happened, because you know he couldn't mobilize enough people to be legionnaires, right? So he, then he had to take in not him but his successor had to take in the gods. And in the beginning, they were trained to be legionnaires. And at the end, they just said, "Oh yeah, just fight for us," right? And then the gods said, "Well, if we fight for them, why don't we just take it over, right?" And that's how it ended. Yeah. By that process, but the depopulation was the key. While in the East, that created Byzantium, there was still a uh, population explosion. And uh, so we are facing a, a depopulation bomb, right? Mm -hmm. That had started in Japan already 10 years ago. It's going to be, you know, and 
you know, I, I think probably migration is, you know, some, I think elite people are thinking we better get, you know, we better let in a sizable number of migrants. Otherwise, we will have no, no people. Yeah. Actually, no, Merkel said that. She said that openly at some point. Um, so I think that, you know, the thinking is there. Um, because, you know, in I, I think in 1900, there were 400 million Europeans and 100 million uh, Africans, right? And then in 20 years, it will be just the opposite. There will be one European and four times as much Africans. And, you know, this creates a totally new geopolitics. Yeah. Um, I'm, I have mixed feelings about this um, because, you know, I think there are too many people. So some amount of depopulation is probably not a bad thing, you know, because like 10 billion, that is just, that's a lot of stress on, on nature. Uh, but think about this, like one young person has to work for four old people yep. and then eight, and then eight old people. Like, you know, we, we just, have no idea how we're even gonna do this yeah this, jason jason you had a good right? thread on this actually because it's a kind of a contentious topic but you know especially for environmentalists but if i paraphrasing it's you know obviously there are a lot of people and there's a lot of environmental resource pressure with that many people however it, you know making the population collapse so quickly that there's um huge amounts of older people and not enough young people to sort of take care of them uh, yeah. will also cause a lot of environmental strain. Well, one thing we talk a lot about on this podcast as well is energy availability and energy issues right. in general. And so, you know, from two different directions, you know, there's pushes to move away from fossil fuels, right? One is that they are non-renewable resources on, on, you know, human time scales. Uh, and two is the is the is the greenhouse gas and climate climate issue and, and stresses on on the larger environment. But the the problem is is that we don't our civilization was built on coal and oil and now you know on natural gas, and we don't know how to run the civilization without that kind of fuel. Um, yeah, it's not clear at all that we can maintain our lifestyles you know with. Right. Doables with yeah, but this is where mutualization comes in, right? So and this yeah. is, you know, maybe against my better judgment, but this, you know, I, I would love. And so this is where, you know, the identitarianism is an absolutely terrible thing. Oh, because can I, can what, I throw we, one more thing before yeah. before I let you go? Before before I, I let you yeah. continue, I, thought, I mean, so and what I was getting to is that it seems likely to me that uh, we will be we're moving towards societies that will be. Uh, less ha have less energy availability and by necessity will be also more labor intense um, especially in agriculture yeah. i think we're going to need a lot more people in agriculture again and industrious, that requires industrious revolution yeah I that requires that. that requires youth that requires strength um that you know in a in a demographic structure that's very top heavy it, i don't see how that's viable right and so there you have right. this you have this really difficult trade-off between overpopulation stressing the planet's resources but then having a healthy demographic structure right and where right. you find that balance and nobody really has control over it anyway that that's that's a wicked issue that's a wicked problem yeah yeah, yeah. yeah i i've been looking at you, you probably know him nafiz ahmed who you know claims that it can be done and i haven't studied enough to have my own judgment that well, he, so, hundred percent renewable. Yeah, it can be done. Yeah, we're uh, skeptical of that on this podcast. I'm, I'm so far, I'm skeptical, but I, no, I. I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily. I don't necessarily. I, I mean, I think it's possible it can be done, but not at the same uh, energy demand that right. we. Yeah. Today, and but, the same know, kind of energy use. I mean, liquid fuels is like eighty percent right. of the economy. Right. Yeah. But so, so here's the political issue that I wanted to to uh, to address. So when I started working, you know, 20, 15 years ago, uh, I've always been political. So the idea was to have red green coalitions, right? Because they are the most likely to push what I call common supportive policies. And you know, it it has happened at the local scale in Italy, in France. 
the problem is, you know, once they made this identitarian turn on the left, is that they're losing. Like the, the French left has lost 50% of its voting base, right? Yeah. And and this is happening all over Europe. So then we what we get is, and I, I think this is different on the continent than in, in the English Sanctuary countries. So we have this kind of populist alliances, right? And but they have a very strong liberal point, you know, liberal in the sense of economically liberal point of view, right? So you have Trump. And he makes all these promises to the working class. And then he gets elected and he makes a tax break for the billionaires, right? And, and actually lost uh, working class votes uh, in the last election. In Europe, the Hungarians and the Poles, they come from a Christian democratic background, right? They actually have basic income. If you So if, if you're a family with two kids and then with three kids, you get like 900 euros or 700 euros from the state. So they've been re-elected four times. So, so they, they have managed markets from kind of Christian, right-wing Christian democratic point of view. And their stable populist coalitions where the working class, according to survey, is the happiest on the continent. Uh, on, then in you know what I see in America, you know I, I follow this very closely. I've lived in the U.S. and I worked like nine years for United States Information Agency, if you believe me. Uh, so yeah, I'm very aware of uh, American stuff. And you know I I see the program of Vivek and Trump. You know you you're gonna face a incredible counter revolution. This is not gonna be 2020. If, if they win. You're talking about dismantling the administrative state, abolishing the Department of Education, abolishing DEI and ESG, um, wanting 5% material growth, investing in fossil fuels. So, you know, we're going to get these swings, right? We're going to get these incredible swings. And I don't think they can solve the issue that way either, right? Uh, because of the material situation uh but this is gonna happen this is gonna happen so so let's, so let's the, the only way is for some kind of progressive force you know to reconnect with that's my view you know i'm an old old style left to reconnect with working class concerns i like in terms of macro change i don't see any other solution but i also can't see any signs that this is happening so right. that's why i think the, for the moment the only you thing you can do is like okay you know you know recreate local infrastructure you know make sure you can survive this what this wild period that is coming towards us and like know where your food comes from where your energy comes from but connect connect trans locally organize yourself build power uh anyway so that's kind of the way i look at things well this is i think a good i mean so we have to wrap up pretty soon um yeah okay uh, uh we have to wrap up pretty soon uh and i think this is a good topic because this is this is a topic that what well, you just said uh that we talk about a lot on this podcast of you know a lot of things are out of our control um politics is going to get weirder and weirder uh and so what can we as individuals and groups of networked individuals do to prepare for the future right and it seems like you kind of answered that maybe we can elaborate a little bit more uh you, you said like you know relocalize uh you know you know ourselves and our communities uh know you know uh build up our local food systems uh, our local energy systems if we can uh, you know know where our water comes so all of this all this localization connect with others do you want to do you want to expand on that a little bit more of like what we can do is is just normal individuals and as networks to you know, uh, kind of keep networks, working right? at building this counter power as organized, yeah, organized networks. I think this is very important because if Wait, Michelle, if let me heard, let me let me just yes. uh, say something too before you answer. Um, I think the other thing that I'd like to hear uh, is the sort of temporal order for this. Um, and I should just say, from my own perspective, I've seen a lot of attempts to sort of digitize first and build relationships through the digital um, fail pretty badly. Like the attempts Wait. to build 
build understandings yeah. or relationships or how things should or be ordered or you know how things should be like the governance people try to digitalize first and then assume the relationships will follow and i'm starting to think now and i wonder whether you agree that the no, physical, I agree with you. I agree with you. The yeah. Ecological, the relational, that. all of that should happen first, and then the digital should sort of bloom out of that. You know, where you're saying systems of yeah. provisioning. It's a get tool. Into it's the... a tool. It's a tool to make you stronger. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, one one thing I noticed. This is just anecdotal, but like when I talk with a happy person on Zoom, they always tell me, "Oh, I quit social media." <laughs> like literally. <laughs> literally like it's and unfortunately i'm a digital curator like i'm stuck <laughs> because you know i like learning and but actually you know what i do i start my day with two hours of reading i don't open my computer in the morning so i'm you know i'm trying to manage uh but then i have you know eight to ten hours of online work and it doesn't make me happy you know it doesn't make me happy. I feel I have to do it, uh, but um, so I, I think you're completely right. You know, we have to be embodied in our, so I'm a strange case, but I, you know, I'm actually embodied with my family, you know, my extended Thai family. Um, and then, you know, I have local, a few local friends, not too many. Um, but uh, yeah, and reading, you know, I know it sounds silly, but um, so we're going to a post-literate society, right? And, and but reading is really essential for, I, I you know, kind of a self-construction. You know, the, the depth that you have through reading, right? The long, the long run thinking, the, so I, I take notes, um, then I reread my notes, and when I, so I read ninety minutes, and then I think about what I've read for thirty minutes. And I've been doing this every day, uh, you know, first half an hour, then one hour. Now I'm at two hours total since twenty twenty. But it's amazing, you know. This is very enriching, right? You 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 really get to know stuff because I look back, even I was what I was thinking into the nineteen. I say, what an ignorant guy I was. <laughs> uh, this, but yeah, I think uh, this is also, you know, if you don't have a past, you don't have a future. That's what I think, right? And 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 now it's like presentism, right? It is everybody is stuck in in the anxiety of the here and now, and that's just not healthy. And that's mm -hmm. promoted by social media, the reactivity, right? So when you measure the brain activity, when you're on social media, it's your reptilian brain. It's not a neocortex, right? Mm -hmm. When you read, it's a neocortex. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think reading is essential. And I, I so maybe I'll end with this. Uh, I'm, I'm dreaming of a, you know, Renaissance technologist, the school for Renaissance technologists. And maybe you've heard about David Chapman, meaningless.com. Have, have you heard about it? Because this is, okay, I'll tell you his theory. And I, I agree with his theory. So. You know, in, in the 70s, we get postmodernism. You know, Derrida, Foucault, but these were all people who were classically trained, right? And then they critically reflect on modernity and objectivity. And I, I think that was a very useful exercise, you know, part of intellectual evolution. But then, you know, we stopped teaching all these things, right? So now, now what his problem is, is he says, we no longer have a bridge from the rational to the transrational. Because now you get young kids, they hardly learn anything in school. They go to the university, social science, and they get deconstructed. But there's nothing to deconstruct. And so now you have an explosion of confusion and mental illness. Um, and so he says, if you look at STEM, you know, a bridge has to stand. Right, so you have to be rational to build a bridge, and and a skyscraper, and and it, what an engineer would do, right? But they're too mechanistic, and so you can broaden their mind, you know, through holistic and more integrative thinking. And I think that's where we are. So I I think that's again why I'm interested in crypto people because they do have some kind of grounding, 
in, in several forms of rationality that tend to get lost. Um, and I, I like the name of your program, Do More Optimism. I'm sure you're aware of it, but so nowadays left-wing people have 300% more mental, diagnosed mental uh, issues than right-wing people. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason is, is because they don't have hope. You know, they, they're so hypercritical um, and, you know, climate change and, and all, you know, so the, the whole, ho there's no transcendent horizon. And maybe the right wing, maybe because they're more linked to their family, to community, maybe to, you know, traditional religion, they still have a capacity to look on the other side. Although, you know, they tend to deny all the problems, right? That, that, that also maybe keeps you happy if you just don't want to see, uh, you know, a lot of the issues that are on the horizon. But uh, yeah, so that's that's basically what I try to do is to have a narrative that is empirical, so willing to change if the facts change, that is coherent, and that creates the the, the maximum amount of believable narrative for change, you know, based on what on what 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 I know. So that's what I'm trying to. Do. I don't know if if ultimately you know will be useful or not, but yeah, that's what I'm trying to do, to get that narrative of change and you know and constantly adapted um and you know and then i believe in deep conversations right where so this is we used to do the twice a year with the p2p foundation and then we got defunded but so we would bring groups together that didn't know each other like believe it or not free software and free hardware didn't know each other 15 years ago <laughs> and you have you you have them talk four or five days, you know, Indian stick, right? So you get the stick, you talk, then you finish, you give it to somebody else. So everybody can speak as long as they want, as short as they want. And so over several days, you create deep connections. And after 18 months after that meeting, miracles would happen. Miracles would happen. Because these people learned to trust each other, remained in touch, and somehow, you know, that that soup that we created then created all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love that. That's so great. Yeah, that's it's pretty pretty aligned with what we've been talking about uh, just within the podcast and the people that we've attracted. Um, just you know, get get them to make real relationships, real friendships, yeah. trusted relationships over time, and and people are just itching for that um, invitation. And once you the good side of feudalism, them, by the way, no feudalism. Because, you know, I, I was listening to Yanis Varoufakis, his new book, right? He says there is a shift from profit to rent. And so these cloud capitalists, says they're, rent, they're rent seekers. And so they, mm -hmm. they have enslaved the capitalists. That, that's his thesis. I think he's right. Mm -hmm. um, but and, but techno-feudalism, uh, my only critique I have is actually feudalism was very personal. It was all based right. on personal loyalty. Yep. This is not feudalism. These no. people don't care at all who you are. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. And so this is, goes back to my original comment, which is something to be aware of the, the alienating um, nature of, you know, the, just the yeah. di disembodiedness. And so I think just yeah, yeah. keeping that in mind is it's really important. It's very important what you're saying that this is this is absolutely essential. Yeah. And I, one day I just need to pick your brain about uh, your historical understanding of different periods and and movements right. over time because it's so uh what what a what a wide ranging um knowledge you have so I really appreciated this conversation thanks for organizing it Jason yeah thank yeah. you Ashley thank you and I just I, I just want to say you know it's it's an honor to talk to you um we don't we don't have uh protocols but I, I definitely see a doomer optimism uh it's kind of modeled after after the cosmolocal idea because we're using the internet to uh encourage people to localize and connect horizontally while they do that um so that's as i think there, we're, we're very much aligned there one last just a little anecdote that i think i want to get to ashley's last point and i think this will also wrap it up is that um i was recently using a software uh that i was excited about i'm still excited about but it was the idea of like a software like a, a bioregional um organizing software and we i got a few people on and most of the people didn't know each other and eventually I had to shut it down because everybody, you know, not everybody, but a few couple people in particular were fighting 
I understood, I, I kind of understood both their points of view. Uh, I, I figured if we were on a campfire, we could like work it out and, you know, develop some camaraderie if we did some projects together. But I ended up shutting it down because I decided that um, the scale was too large. We needed to meet more in real life. We needed to develop mm -hmm. functional relationships where we collaborated on actual projects, getting our hands dirty. Uh, and I, you know, so it was premature. And eventually, you know, I, I see this software as being very valuable, but only after we we, we set the groundwork of, yeah. of relationships. And I, I think uh, I agree with that. And I, that was the big mistake that we made you know, think about Occupy and all that stuff. So an extraordinary ability to or to organize very rapidly millions of people. Yeah. But nothing lasted. Yeah. It, and it actually created the identitarian reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's often is a defeat of the progressives that leads to these kinds of outcomes because we fuck it up ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cool. um, well, uh, so we can't. We can't. We, we you know we can't redo that. We can't. This is done. We yeah. need to organize seriously over time, create trust, and allow people to have open conversation, have different opinions, but yeah, and see commonality, right? Um, yeah. Well, hopefully, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping as we all go forward in our projects, uh, we can connect again in various ways uh collaborate in various ways and um yeah i mean i feel like we could we could we could talk for for hours more about about these topics Good. i can't believe me <laughs> <laughs> i believe you i believe <laughs> cool all right well, all right. well thanks thanks both of you uh this should be going up probably in a couple of weeks or so yeah thank you so much it was a really pleasure oh, by the way you're, you, you want to talk about your Substack to to wrap up uh, your oh, yeah yeah um so, but I'll probably send it to you. So, so there's two stuff to follow my work. Mm -hmm. um, the wiki, mm -hmm. wiki.p2pfoundation.net, 25,000 articles, raked up 1 billion views over you know, 15 years. Everything you ever wanted to know about peer-to-peer -peer in the commons, in spirituality, in business and politics, it's all there. It's really, really extensive. And then I just started because I just couldn't stand Facebook anymore. We've been creating for many years, but it's so sick and toxic. So I'm creating a Substack, fourth civilization dot substack.com. But you know, I'll maybe you can put it under the video and then people Yeah, we'll, will we'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it in the show yeah. notes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna write at least once a week, probably more. And I'm gonna do my curation there. And and because you you know you keep your emails, I think they, they get 30%. Right now I'm doing it for free, um, but uh, you know eventually maybe I'll 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 have some articles for people who want to pay, but we'll see. I've been I've been writing for free for 15 years. It's hard to change my habit. <laughs> well, uh, we we appreciate it. It is a wealth of resources. I have looked through it uh, myself. Um, all right. Well, uh, thanks yeah. to both of you. Until next time. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.